Well, I want to start out wishing all of our mothers a happy Mother's Day, and we will be having a special Mother's Day blessing for you and a little gift at the end. So, um, you know, the thing is, the world doesn't always appreciate mothers, unfortunately, but heaven does. So we see how much Jesus loves and honors his mother. She is the highest saint in heaven. And so she doesn't have an advanced degree um, other than her job as uh, a homemaker and a mother. We don't know that she had any other jobs, but yet God recognizes and values motherhood. The patience, the charity involved in all the work, diaper changing. I've made it to almost 60 and I haven't changed one diaper. Now my brother got stuck changing my diapers because he was 14 years old when I was born. So I guess, uh, I'm guessing like maybe mom asked dad to help out and he said, Tom, get over here. <laughs> Take care of your brother, will you? <laughs> so, so all of these difficult, sacrificial, loving jobs that God has given. And so heaven loves mothers and appreciates their work. And good sons and good daughters and good husbands and fathers also appreciate that. So, so today, whatever the world may say, whatever the world may try to do to devalue women and say, oh, you know, they need to be in the workplace. Well, they are in the workplace. They're in the sacred workplace of taking care of new human beings, working with God to create new life, and keeping the world going. So everybody comes from their mother. That's the way God set it up. And so that's the beauty, uh, the gift of life. Sometimes people call it the superpower of women, <laughs> able to have life. So working with God, new life is created through them. And so. Again, today is a day dedicated to appreciating that. Now, I'm going to focus mainly on our second reading, uh, Revelation chapter 7. There's just a lot in that that jumped out at me. So the first thing, <laughs> the first two lines just makes me laugh when I read it because, you know, I had to listen to professors and read books that say, John did not write the book Revelation. Like, Excuse me. Chapter 7, I, John, you know, had a vision. <laughs> says he says right there, John, you know. So uh, the Gospel of John, which is my favorite, and the book of Revelation, which is by John, have a wonderful insights and things that can teach us and inspire us. So first of all, he has a vision of a great multitude which no one could count from every nation, race, people, and tongue. So, you know, when the Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door, and they tell you there's only 144,000 saved. And you're like, well, it says here in chapter 7, there's a huge multitude which no one could count. And by the way, while we're at it, uh, what's your membership number? Does it, does it exceed 144,000? Because maybe some of you aren't going to make it, you know? So um, you got to be careful with all the numbers in Revelation. So then it says, they stood before the throne wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. Sounds like Palm Sunday in heaven, doesn't it? So um, we stand there holding the palms on Palm Sunday. So the earthly liturgy is connected to and reflects the heavenly liturgy. So then it says, one of the elders said to me, these are the ones who have survived the time of the great distress. Aha, what is the great distress? If you're a Dickens fan like me, you're familiar with the line, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was like all times. And so really, when you look through history, there's a whole lot of great distress going on, you know. Uh, I didn't live through World War II. My dad was in the army and he was over there uh, and he was up against Rommel uh, over there in the desert. And uh, so there's a lot of distressing times. Now at the end, there's going to be a great distress. And that may be what this is pointing towards, but you know, the idea of the great, the time of great distress, that's really where we are now. What is there for us to be distressed about? Well, we're going through a period of testing and it's important testing because if we fail the test, we don't make it to heaven and there's nothing worse than that. So it's a test to see what we choose. Well, what are the choices? Well, Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth 
where thieves steal and rust corrodes. Lay up for yourselves rather treasure in heaven, where there are no thieves and no rust. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be. So is our heart in heaven? Is, is our heart treasuring the goods of heaven? Because the things of this world are going to try to pull us away from the love of God and the love of heaven. So there's sinful things that are temporary, that do not satisfy. They are basically a little bit of a temporary escape, get our minds off of things, we still have to come back to reality. Whereas God offers us not a temporary, sinful, false heaven, but the true heaven of grace that is eternal. And he's right up front about it that yes, to get to heaven, you're gonna to have to carry your cross. You're gonna to have to deny yourself. You're gonna to have to uh, do as the scripture says, son, uh, get up today and labor in the vineyard. Go work in the vineyard today. So we're called to work in the vineyard. We're called to deal with the testing. We're, we're called to train that we may reign with God. And so we are in a time of distress, but it's also a time of blessing and graces where we get to come and know the Lord. So it says here that they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Interesting phrase. So the white robe, now I wear an alb, and that's connected to the, the scripture references, the white robe. Jesus appears wearing a white robe with a gold sash, dressed as a priest in the beginning of the Gospel of John. And so the white robe is a symbol for us being free from sin and being forgiven because of the blood of the Lamb on the cross. So how do we get there? Well, first we are washed, right? So we're in the washing of baptism, the washing of the soul. And so we're washed free of those sins. And then in Holy Communion, we are connected to the blood of the Lamb. Because in the Eucharist, we receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. And so we're, we are nourished by God. So as it goes on, for this reason, they stand before God's throne and worship him day and night in his temple. And so the beauty of standing before the throne of God. Now, although we are not in heaven yet, do we have the throne of God here on earth? Well, we have a, a reasonable facsimile. It's called the tabernacle. So as we come in here, we enter into the place of the house of God. The throne of God here on earth is at the tabernacle. That's why we genuflect. It says in scripture, every knee shall bend, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so our Eucharistic Lord, the bread of life, the living bread, come down from heaven on the altar and then in the tabernacle. Um, we enter into his presence and he blesses us with many gifts and graces. Now, some of you may, uh, may have some uh, other blood in you than I have like super white because I'm like Irish and German. So when I go to the beach, I don't really tan. I go kind of from white to red although I may try. So, you know, but those of you that are sun worshipers, you lay out there and, uh, you know, with your eyes are closed, you can sense the sun is on your, on your skin and it feels nice and warm, you know? Sun-kissed like the fruit, right? <laughs> so, so in the same way, when we're in the presence of the Lord and recognize that in the depths of our hearts and we think about the words of Jesus, I am the bread of life. I am with you always until the end of time. And, um, and we think, how does Jesus fulfill that? Well, the way in which Jesus is here on the earth is in the Eucharist. And that will be the way that his presence is on earth until the second coming. And so it's important for us to recognize that. So, so when we are at prayer in the presence of the Eucharist, even though we don't see it, just like we don't see the sun's rays if our eyes are closed at the beach, we can feel within our soul. We are in the presence of the Prince of Peace. We are in the presence of the loving God who designed us, who created us, who gave us every good thing we ever received, who's behind every ounce of love we have ever felt, every truth we have ever known, every good thing that has ever come our way. Its source and origin is in God. And so um, there's a beauty to that. Just even if you can't pray, if you're too tired to pray, sometimes I get here and I'm I'm a little tired, I'm not really up to praying. So I just sit there and recognize that I'm in the presence of the Lord and we let him speak to us at that time. So as we go on further, 
It says here, uh, they stood before God's throne. The one who sits on the throne will shelter them. And so God gives us the ultimate shelter in heaven, physical and spiritual and emotional. They will not hunger or thirst anymore. Now, what does that mean? So we, on a spiritual level, we hunger for truth and we thirst for love. And God gives us that. And it goes on to say, For the Lamb who is in the center of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to springs of life-giving water. Now that's one of those beautiful phrases in the scripture. Jesus says when he speaks to the Samaritan woman in John, I will give you living water and I will make a spring within you welling up unto eternal life. So when we are baptized and, and the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit dwell within our soul, then we have that spring we are connected to God. As we see here, what does it say? He will give them the springs of life-giving water. So that spring, the source itself, when God is within us, within our soul, we have the source of life, love, truth, and goodness. So um, the beauty of that phrasing, we, and so from the side of Jesus, his side was pierced and the blood and water flowed forth, just as Moses struck the rock in the desert and the water came out. And so, you know, if someone offers you, they say, would you like to have a glass of water or would you like to have the spring? You're like, well, I'd rather have the spring because then I have the source, infinite source of water instead of one cup that lasts a little bit. Well, that's what we got to watch out for, taking the little cups of sin that the serpent dangles in front of us to choose over the spring and the source. So we go for little pieces of, of beauty and goodness and love and and uh, things for, to massage our ego temporarily, selfishness, and then we miss the mark. When we go to God, we have the source of all beauty, all love, all life, all truth, and all goodness. The spring itself, God himself. And so that's the beauty of heaven. So that's part of the thing I have in the, um, in the uh, mural there, the springs. The living water coming down over there on the left and then on the right where the bad thief is, it's all desolate. There's no water there. You can see the water behind Christ falls into the ravine and it's bone dry. But over here in beautiful green and the turquoise water, I had Lisa make it turquoise because it looks like one of those commercials for the Bahamas or something. So I thought it looked better than just, just blue. So you have the, the, the uh, living spring of water coming down from the top of the mountain pointing to this, to this beautiful truth of Scripture. So, you know, as St. Augustine says, our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in you. Psalm 62, in God alone is my soul at rest. And so there's nothing else that can fill. There's a heart, in the center of our heart, there's a spot that says God alone. And you cannot substitute anything or anyone else. Only God can fill the center of our hearts. So as we go on the next line after, he will lead them to springs of life-giving water, our shepherd, the good Lord, the good shepherd for our souls. It says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, let's think about that a minute. In the painting of the sacred heart of Jesus, what do we see? The thorns, the crown of thorns is around his heart, pointing to all the pain that he feels in his heart for the people that he died for on the cross and have rejected his love and truth. It's a sad thing. Now, um, in the apparition by, uh, to St. Catherine Labre, the miraculous medal, they have the sacred heart of Jesus surrounded with the thorns and the gash on the side from the soldier's lance. Then Mary, of course, has the flowers around her heart for purity, but she has a sword piercing her heart because she's Our Lady of Sorrows at the foot of the cross, watching her son die, watching her son's sacred heart be pierced with the lance and the blood and the water flow out. So the injuries to the heart can be pretty bad. Now, we've, I'm sure we have injuries to the body that can be pretty bad. But it says here, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So all of us, I think, carry around within us, within our hearts, emotional scars from various levels of hurt in life, whether it was, you know, rejection or, or hurt or whatever. Then there's the guilt that we, we might carry for our own sins. And God's gonna fix that as well. 
He will let us know we are forgiven forever, restored forever to the innocence we had before the sin. And that's the beauty of the power of God's love and grace to bring us peace and forgiveness. <coughs> to have those springs of life-giving water, the mercy and grace of God flowing over our soul, washing our soul clean, made clean and white in the blood of the Lamb. So, uh, beautiful imagery in this uh, book of Revelation, chapter 7. So, so all of the hurts within our soul, within our heart, that we accumulate through life. Now, we can help heal that with God's help um, through prayer. One of the most helpful things for hurts that I've suffered in life, whatever kind they may be, um, prayer has helped to heal my heart to an extent. But it's still not healed 100%. None of us are. But prayer is a great source of healing for e emotional scars that we carry with us throughout life. But then when we finally make it to the throne, God will wipe away every tear from our eyes, every scar from our heart. We will be completely healed, completely forgiven on every level, physical, emotional, spiritual, mental completely forgiven, completely restored, and given a place with the throne of God forever in heaven, never ever again to be damaged or disruptive. And that's what the Lord offers us. That's what he gained for us on the cross. Those springs of life-giving water that flow from his side and into our heart, into our mind, and into our soul. So the beauty of the love of God, it's a wonderful thing. And when we interpret uh, Revelation chapter 7 and see these, these beautiful terms that John wrote that through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we can see the love of God at work. So let us do our best to cooperate with his grace that we may be with the Lord at his throne, not only here on earth, but in heaven, and that those beautiful springs of living water, of healing water that can flow within our heart and soul here and now, and ultimately completely heal us forever in heaven.